Hello and welcome to the Trinity Channel. My name is Dr. Tony Costa and it is a pleasure to have you along. We're going to be looking at uh, an investigation of the Quran and today we're going to be looking at the subject of Surah 1 and hatred. Now you're probably wondering uh, what hatred has to do with uh, Surah 1. Well, the word Surah, of course, for those who are not Muslims, uh, the word Surah is simply a reference to uh, the chapter in the Quran. The Quran is made up of 114 surahs or chapters and uh, the word surah is simply the Arabic word for that beginning uh, chapter of each uh, section of the Quran. And uh, we selected surah one today because there's some very interesting words that are in there. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to mention before we deal with the subject of uh, hatred here uh, is the fact that uh, most standard Qurans today have 114 surahs. Uh, this was not always the case. Um, we know that uh, there were other Qurans uh, in uh, just the time after Muhammad that uh, differed in the length that we have today in our modern Qurans. Uh, the Quran of Ibn Masud, for instance, who was one of the companions of Muhammad, uh, had 111 surahs. It had three surahs missing, and one of them was this one. He did not think that this surah belonged in the Quran. And uh, if you look at the Quranic um, edition of uh, Ubay bin Kab, who was another companion of Muhammad, you'll notice that his Quran had 116 surahs. He had two additional surahs uh, more than the standard uh, Quran. And so uh, this will be a subject for another time, but uh, this clearly demonstrates that the Quran did not always remain static, as many of our Muslim friends say. Now, why do we talk about Surah 1 and hatred? Well, in order to understand this, let me quote to you uh, Surah 1, which again is composed of seven verses, and it states this. It says, In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment, thee alone we worship, thee alone we ask for help. Show us the straight path, the path of those whom thou hast favored, not the path of those who earn thine anger, nor of those who go astray. I want you to look at that last verse, or at least consider that last verse, verse 7 of Surah 1. It says, the path of those whom thou hast favored, not the path of those who earn thine anger, nor of those who go astray. Now, there are three groups uh, being referred to here, um, those who uh, Allah has favored, and this has always be, been understood to refer to the Muslims. But then it refers to two other groups. It refers to those who earn thine anger and those who go astray. And I have a question for you. Who are those that have earned Allah's anger and who are those who have gone astray? Well, in order to understand this, uh, we have to look to the tafsir, which is the collection of the commentaries or the commentators on Islam and what they teach. So we want to ask the question, who and what is the Quran referring to here? Now, How important is the first surah? Well, the first surah is very important in Islamic prayers because in the Salat, because surah one is recited at least by every faithful Muslim, Muslim 17 times a day. That's a lot of times. 17 times a day they recite this surah in their prayers. And it is in the form of a prayer. It's addressed to Allah. One of the reasons why Ibn Masud rejected the surah was because he believed that this surah did not belong in the Quran simply because uh, if the Quran is the words of Allah being spoken to us, then why is it that this uh, surah is being addressed to Allah? In other words, is Allah speaking to himself? Is Allah praying to himself? And so forth. And therefore, um, this is some, somewhat of, a, of an oddity. Why is Allah praying to himself if these are the words of Allah to us? Now, let's look at what the commentators have to say about those who have earned Allah's anger and those who have gone astray. And it's important to realize here, folks, that uh, when Muslims are praying this prayer 17 times a day, they are saying something about these two particular groups. Well, let's look at Tafsir ibn Kathir, one of the most respected commentators on the Quran, and let's see what he says here. Listen to, to uh, ibn Kathir. 
This is why they were led astray. We should also mention that both the Christians and the Jews, so those are the two groups now being identified here, have earned the anger and are led astray but the anger is one of the attributes more particular of the Jews. Now notice this, the Jews in particular are singled out here as the objects of Allah's wrath. He says, the law said about the Jews, those Jews who incurred the curse of Allah and his wrath, and he refers to Surah 5 verse 60, the attribute that the Christians deserve most is that of being led astray just as Allah said about them, who went astray before and who misled many and strayed themselves from the right path, Surah 5, verse 77. So we now know who the identity of these two groups are, the Jews and the Christians. The Jews are those who've earned Allah's anger, and the Christians are those who have been led astray or who have gone astray. Now this helps us to explain and understand the rabid anti-Semitism that we see particularly in the Muslim world towards Israel and the Jewish people. And that's because the Quran identifies the Jewish people as those who have incurred the wrath of Allah, his anger. And so if Allah is angry at them and his wrath is being poured out on them, then it's only logical that the Muslims would do so in imitation as well. Well, let's look at another commentator. Uh, this comes from Tifsir Ibn Abbas. And this is what he says. The path of those whom thou hast favored the religion of those whom you have blessed with the religion and who are the followers of Moses before the blessings of Allah deserted them. Notice that, before the blessings of Allah deserted them. Meaning that the Jews at one time were under the blessing of Allah as they were led by Moses or Musa, but that has ended, that has stopped. In that he shaded them with a white cloud and sent down on them honey and quails when they were in the wilderness. It is also said that the path of those whom thou hast favored refers to the prophets, not of those who earned thine anger, not the religion of the Jews who earned your anger. Notice that? The Jews are the ones who've earned Allah's anger, whom you forsook and whose hearts you did not protect until they became complacent. Then he defines who are those who've gone astray, nor of those who go astray, nor the religion of the Christians. So listen up, folks. Jews and Christians are being targeted in this surah. So 17, 17 times a day, Muslims are repeating this prayer, and they're saying, the Jews have earned thine anger, and the Christians have gone astray. And this is being repeated 17 times a day. So you can understand why Islam regards Judaism and Christianity as apostate false religions, and so forth. And he goes on to say, who have erred from Islam, that is, the Christians have erred from Islam, amen, thus shall it be, it's custodians. It is also said that an amen, that's at the end of the surah, means let it be so. It is also said that it means, O oh, our Lord, do with us as we have requested you, and Allah knows best. So notice that in this surah, we're also told here that in verse 6, that uh, show us the straight path. And what that means, of course, is that in Islam, Islam is not necessarily a religion of salvation. Islam is a religion of guidance. And so the idea in Islam is not about being saved. The idea in Islam is about being rightly guided, that is, following the true guidance of Allah, which is Islam. And this is another reason why you will notice that when when Muslims speak about the companions of Muhammad, like uh, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, they will refer to them as the rightly guided caliphs, the rightly guided caliphs. And so notice how Islam is being distinguished sharply from Judaism and Christianity. So again, why is there this hatred? Now, can we call this hatred? Well, of course, because the Jews are being singled out without uh, qualification, without exception. The Jews are pointed to be those who have earned Allah's anger. They are the targets of his anger. And Christians, without exception, not some are good, some are bad, but all of them, without exception, have gone astray. And so if you are repeating this over and over again in your prayers, 
then what type of a picture does this form in your mind about Jews and Christians? Well, it's not a positive picture. It is most definitely a negative picture about Jews and Christians. I have one more uh, commentator here. So we've heard from two commentators, Ibn Kathir and Ibn Abbas, and now we want to look at Tafsir al-Jalalain. And notice what it says here. The path of those whom you have favored with guidance, not the path of those against whom there is wrath, namely the Jews. Notice the consistency here. I'm not right. I didn't make this up, folks. Uh, no one here at the Trinity Channel made these up. These, these verses were here long before you and I came. And so these commentators were here long before you and I came. And they're identifying who these people are. It says here, not the path of those against whom there is wrath, namely the Jews, and nor of those who are astray, namely the Christians. Now notice what he says here. He expands further on this. The subtle meaning implied by this substitution is that the guided ones, notice this, the guided ones are neither the Jews nor the Christians. So according to this surah, which Muslims take to be the word of Allah, they take these verses to be the very word of Allah, according to these verses, what do Muslims take with this? What they take from this is that Jews and Christians are not guided by Allah. And that is why Islam is on a move to proselytize, to bring people back to Islam in their minds. So once again, the subtle meaning implied by the substitution is that the guided ones are neither the Jews nor the Christians, but God knows best what is right, and to him is the return and the final resort. And then it goes on to say this, May God bless our Lord Muhammad. That's correct. Our Lord or Master Muhammad. His family and companions and grant them everlasting peace. Sufficient is God for us. An excellent guardian is he. There is no power and no strength save in God, the high, the tremendous. And so once again, folks, the reason why we've entitled this segment Surah One in Hatred is because in this first surah, and all you have to do, folks, if you don't have a Quran at home, all you have to do is go online and look for online Quran, go to the first surah, and read the first, uh, the, the, those, those verses. There's only seven of them. But pay close attention, particularly to verses 6 and to verses 7. And so what do we take from this? Well, we take from this that every time Muslims pray, they are reciting this. They are thinking about these things. And here's another reason why. It is not something, we hear of these ecumenical uh, meetings, we hear of these ecumenical prayers, uh, we hear, for instance, uh, people inviting Muslims to come and do their prayers in their churches. And what many pastors don't realize, and if you're a pastor and you're watching this program, please, please listen up. Please pay close attention to what I'm saying. When you invite Muslims to come into your church, or let's say if you're a Jewish rabbi, you want to invite Muslims to pray in your synagogue because you think you're being ecumenical or you think you're being loving to your neighbor or you think you're being very friendly and so forth, what you must bear in mind is that when the prayers are conducted, the prayers are conducted in Arabic. So number one, unless you are a native speaker of Arabic, you're not going to know what's being said in those prayers. Number two, when those prayers are being recited in Arabic, they always recite Surah 1. They recite Surah 1 at all occasions, in prayers, and weddings, funerals, and so forth. So when they're reciting this, these prayers in your church or in your synagogue, you must bear in mind that they are reciting Surah 1. And in Surah 1, what are they doing? They are essentially cursing you. They're essentially cursing your religion. They're essentially cursing your faith. They're saying to uh, the Jewish people that you have earned Allah's anger. The only way out is if you become a Muslim and abandon Judaism. And if they are reciting these prayers in your church, Pastor, what they're doing is they're cursing you and cursing your faith. Let's wake up and let's listen up. Thank you very much.